Good morning. Welcome to the Celtic Way Morning Briefing Live. I'm Tony Haggerty, a Haggerty 10, and I'm joined today by Sean Martin at Sean Martin TCW Twitter handle. It's October the 31st, but no horror show yesterday, Sean. It was indeed a brilliant performance from Celtic, very clinical, very professional, and has led to another one, what we like to call a happy Monday, Sean. <laughs> I was going to say, is that what you call it? Is it a happy Monday? <laughs> uh, I certainly was. I you were you had the pleasure of taking it in in person again, and very impressed by all accounts. You were waxing lyrical there. You thoroughly enjoyed yourself. I did. Do you know what? I I thought, considering the way the ground, or sorry, Almond Vale has been for mm-hmm. Celtic in the past, visiting it and not being a happy hunting ground, I, I really did think they made light work of that yesterday. And that's twice in a row they've gone to. Livingston and won very convincingly, Sean, and certain players uh, played, stepped up to the plate and played really well. And yesterday, the back four for me were superb. Greg Taylor in particular, mm-hmm. Aaron Moy in midfield, Kyogo up front, and uh, and also uh, Jota when he came on. So lots to enthuse about. William Lamont coming in there. I saw that right away there, Tony. I saw well, that. Told you, Andrew Stark, go, you did. I get 10 out of 11. Uh, he made a big call. But again, I did say I wouldn't be perturbed if Kyogo played. And mm-hmm. ultimately, uh, he scored a cracking goal. And as I said, lots to enthuse about, Sean, about that performance. Mm-hmm. Not least the three goals, but just in general, the way they played and the way they... they there just didn't seem to be any pressure on them, despite the fact that they're... Rangers had narrowed the gap to one point going into that match, but played as if they didn't care about that. I don't think they did care about it. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> yeah, I think yeah, it played yeah, like yeah, I don't think they did. Um, yeah. I must admit, Tony, I'm loving all this uh, Greg Taylor love that, that's oh, going sure up yeah. um, Makes me a bit uneasy because for ages there it was like batting my head against the wall saying, no, no, I like him, I like him, he's a good player and all that. And now it's like 99% love <laughs> yes, coming indeed. from all quarters for him. Um, and but, uh, I think two goals in two games. Yeah. Well, 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 correct, correct, Mundo. I, 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 she's an early contender for player of the year, uh, certainly. I mean, I, I, I agree. I don't think that's a controversial thing. I know no. it's obviously only October, I, but I mean, we'll be doing, Tony, we'll be doing what... Um, Half season power rankings. It's not quite going to be half season, but certainly when they break up for the World Cup, I'll be tackling yep. that spreadsheet again. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's up in the podium places, if not top. Right. And that's not just because it's an edict that you need to give him the nine or ten. <laughs> no, I I have to say as well, and I wrote it in the piece that I did today, and it's on the site, and Sean will put the link up to that mm-hmm. uh, if you want to have a read at that. But that first goal for me typified. I hate yep. the phrase Anne's ball, but it typified the inverted fullback system, didn't it? They worked it around the midfield and then it's shunted out to Ralston, who's inside a bit, and he gives it to his fellow fullback. And another touch, Kyogo takes a touch mm-hmm. and then hits a beauty. And I think, if anything, that's the kind of goal that would have delighted Ange yesterday with Taylor being the inverted fullback and then going, playing that pass because he's breaking through the lines mm-hmm. and uh, Kyogo doing what he does best. And I thought Kyogo was back to his best just because he's running off the ball was superb as well. And he gave them a torrid time just trying to match him and where he was going. And after he scored, you saw every Celtic midfielder look for Kyogo making those runs. Mm-hmm. Didn't always come off. But he was always playing off the shoulder and looking for that. And that was a good sign. It's good to see him back in the old routine. And he made the chance harder for himself, actually. That touch. finish wasn't the finish of a guy that's uh, feeling Probably. a little bit off in front of a goal, was it? <laughs> No, nah, that was a Kyogo of old who just thought, out my feet, bang, and uh, emphatic finish. And I, and I think everything about it just settled Celtic, mm-hmm. settled the fans, it settled, settled the team, and they went on to enjoy a good afternoon. And I think 3 0 was kind of flattered Livingston a bit. It, it could have and should have been more. I think uh, there's a comment here, and it was um, uh, Robert Gibson saying Celtic completely controlled the game, but just as much. Livy Livy done absolutely nothing, and a lot of that was to do with the way that Celtic played that game. I think um, there's also the consideration, we were talking about Kyogo there, found it interesting what Ange says to you um, in the press conference after it about Kyogo, specifically that he, I thought initially he was talking about the kind of criticism was unfair, what he was actually meaning was the situation he's put him in was a wee bit unfair in terms of 
he's not necessarily getting the run that he got at this time last year because, well, Jack and Marcus obviously wasn't ready at this time, well, just about this time last year, as we come to, <laughs> he started getting a game. Um, but basically, Ange Postacoglu says last year, Kyogo was scoring every week, or it felt like he was scoring every week because he was playing him from the start every single week. Yep. Whereas this year, he's very conscious of the fact that he doesn't want it to be, he's playing him all the time and he gets another in- injury where he's out for two months. Basically says, I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding that this year. That's, that's just not going to happen if I've got uh, the control of it. So, he kept, it was a, it was an interesting point. Put it up, yeah, it? he was protecting me, protecting his two strikers because he doesn't want them out for any length of time. Because he mentioned that Kyogo was out for two months. And I, I thought, as you say, I thought that was an interesting point as well that he was making. And mm-hmm. yeah, uh, he was full of interesting points yesterday. And to be fair, uh, afterwards, I think what else caught your eye? Uh, he was just generally kind of purring about the kind of whole team performance, and he was the one that mentioned mentality. Mm-hmm. That's the strong mentality, and he also spoke about Jota. Uh, so it was good to have him back, and he also spoke about Moy, saying Moy, which you see him after the World Cup, he'll be some player, and I thought he's some player just now. <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh, I was thinking, well. And you trust the manager because if he's telling you, look, there's more to come for this guy, then you know there's more to come for this guy. And he played very well yesterday, I have to say, yeah. Sean. No, I do. I, I think he played well. I, I think he played well. Domestically, certainly, he's, he's been rising to the occasion lately. Yeah. I think that's a fair comment. I do think he's probably, it's, it's not a massive leap to say that he'll be better after the World Cup if he's getting games and all that because I think there is still a lot more to come from yeah. him. I don't think he's he's at the peak of his powers yet, which is probably what I'm just kind of referring to. But Going away, and he's going to be one of the few players that's actually going to the World Cup when when they break. It's it's not going to be a yeah. um, a couple of friendlies for him. He'll be playing serious competitive games in the, the kind of biggest stage of all, uh, right after leaving the other big stage of all, the Champions League. So I I, I agree with him. I think um, I think that's a fair point from Andrew. And it's a kind of sensible point as well that the more he plays, the more competitive games he plays yeah. after the amount of time he wasn't playing for, then the, the better he should get. Whether I I would argue whether or not that he's going to come back and actually be in the team will depend on the, the fitness of the other midfielders because I still don't think he's he's uh, his first three, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. I also asked Ange, and he, he kind of smiled at this question. I said to him, I know he likes his football played a certain way, mm-hmm. but that contest yesterday with Cameron Carter-Vickers and right. Nubley was just brilliant. You couldn't take your eyes off it, and it was great to watch. It was just two guys, brute strength and brute force, going at it. And he kind of laughed and he said, yeah, we knew if we could you know, cut off the supply to him and nullify that threat that Livingston, you know, we would have a good chance of success. But he was laughing because I think he enjoyed it as well. I know he's all about tidy, slick and attacking football, but every now and again, I think he just likes a up and at them kind of thing. And that was that's what, that yesterday was a, a good old fashioned throwback, Sean, to just two big guys having a right good tussle. And it was brilliant to watch. I really enjoyed that part of the game as well. I am... Um... I thought he dealt all right with him. See, considering in the early stages, you, I thought he was maybe going to give him a wee bit of trouble. But what I said there to you about the cutting off the supply was was key to that, I think, because yeah. I think he only had one shot all game. Yep. Uh, Joel Nubley, and he has been given a lot of teams, a lot of teams' issues yes. this season. Um, so I, I, th- I think they dealt fine with him. And I think more at the point, as I say, that cutting off that supply meant he didn't really get the chance to, to do yeah. anything other than showcase his physical Prowess, if you want to put it that way. He never really got the chance in front of goal, which I think was a testament to you. He spoke him. about the need to nullify Livingston playing for free kicks and throw-ins. Aye, for territory. Yeah, and all that for territory, stuff. yeah. So, and he said that the, the that Celtic had worked on that or had spoken mm-hmm. about that and he knew that was a kind of key to success in the game. And I, I think they did that very well and that was a big part of it. They mm-hmm. couldn't get the ball to Nubly. And when mm-hmm. they, they only did it a few times, didn't get much joy. But that, that was the biggest chance of success in the game or staying in the game if they got Aye. it to him when he mm-hmm. when he did something. But it, they just the supply was cut off uh, by everybody working hard. It was a, I just thought it was a really good team performance, you know. Uh, but I know same, and I think I was trying to I was quickly try to Google it because I can't remember off the top of my head what it was last year. But at Almondville, the the first game last year, uh, the deci- I think this kind of helps show the difference in, in approach and you say his mentality, that kind of thing. But they didn't fall into that trap. You're, you were mentioning there that in the other way, 
they stopped Livy being able to play for territory and free kicks and set pieces and just launching it and hoping that yeah. they get a goal. It did work last year a couple of times. Um, but just as much going the other way, they didn't fall into the trap that Livy were probably hoping they would fall into of shifting it out wide and then not really knowing what to do. So throwing it in the box to yep. well, Kyogo started again. So it would have been throwing it in the box to Kyogo and three or four, whatever you want to put it, uh, big, uh, big defenders. They'd done that last year and it was frustrating. You remember yeah. it was really, really frustrating. You were there as well. It was yeah. uh, it was really, really frustrating to watch. It was boring to watch. Um, Rangers fell into that trap at their own ground the other yes. like, last weekend. Celtic, to their credit, didn't fall into that trap. They and the first goal you already mentioned the first goal typifies that rather than yeah. just going wide and throwing it in. They used their fullbacks in the positions they were taking up in the half spaces, and it led to the first goal. And once you get that first goal. All bets are off with, with how many Celtic could get occasionally. So that first goal actually came from Joe Hart's throw in initially mm. after Nubly had his shot at goal from the free kick when he was unmarked. And mm. Hart's thrown it out and then Celtic work it about the midfield till it eventually goes to Ralston, who gives it to Taylor and then Kyogo scores. But it was that passage of play. And that's what I liked about it, Sean. They weren't throwing in a uh, hitting hope balls into the box. They were whenever they were in and around the box, they were always trying to play through the lines, trying to play the give and goes, try to open and carve Livingston up defensively, mm -hmm. which I really, really liked. And even when it went out wide, it wasn't just tossed in there because I think they realised, well if Jack and Marcus isn't there to contest the area late and it's Kyogo then and he's up against, as you say, three central defenders then there is no point. Mm -hmm. So they would work it back and try to get, you know, into decent positions. And I thought they got a lot of joy from that. And I think, you should probably point that out as well, that I think that through Livingston, because I think they maybe expected Celtic just to go down the flank and throw in cutbacks or crosses and, and hit and hope and just uh, hope that somebody's on the end of it. But I think that he mm -hmm. speaks a lot, the manager, about doing everything with a purpose. I thought yesterday they did everything with a purpose, I have to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think... Um... Even when Yakimakis came on, I didn't feel that they reverted to kind of overly being reliant on throwing it in towards them. They did it a couple of times, but I um, I mean, we'll come to Yakimakis, I suppose, with the, the penalty. It was, so, it was so frustrated, Tony. Like, it was just, I know you you obviously would have been at the game and didn't have the benefit of a replay at the point. I had the benefit of a replay and it just, it looked absolutely seething, not just with the penalty thing. But missing when he went through after it as well. Yeah, when yeah. He yeah. rushed it because he was obviously thinking, I need to make I need to make up for this and stuff. And I very, very frustrated. But do you know what? You said in your, your post match thing that it didn't matter in the end and it didn't. But I love to see it. I love to see somebody raging when they don't quite get their uh, get Do you know why he was raging? He was raging because he took the same kind of penalty, Sean, with the one step run up. Aye. Lack he always takes the same kind of penalty, but he went the same corner yeah. and he missed again. So uh, to me it was a, a bit lackadaisical, you know, you got me yeah. to put your foot right through that, and I know he's good at it and but flashback to a year ago when we had exactly yeah, the same did, conversation and you said exact, exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> and he did the exact same thing. You know, and, and no wonder he's annoyed at himself. He should be annoyed at himself. Granted it didn't matter in the grand schema. Thankfully it didn't. Because hmm. that could you know it could have been one of those games against Livingston, but it wasn't. And maybe he was too relaxed. Going up to hit it, I don't know, but as you say, I, I only saw the replay when I went into the press room and he was raging at himself. And mm -hmm. hopefully, if we get another penalty and he's on it, then he rams it into the back of the net. None of this kind of lack of days, but just go and hit it, you know. And the uh, thing is, he's not going to do that because as I remember, I broke it all down, I went and looked at all his yeah, yeah, did. and stuff last year. So I didn't have a problem with the way that he approached it because if he'd approached it in a different way, he would have been overthinking it. Because mm -hmm. that's the way that he takes every penalty that he takes. Yeah, the only yeah, difference yeah. I was the only thing I can point out was he'd never scored when he went bottom left. Yeah. So I don't know if maybe he went bottom left because he assumed the keeper would have done their research and thought he'll definitely not go bottom left. So he thought I'll go bottom left. But he always kind of takes it that kind of not like well, like a days ago. I it probably was that's probably an accurate way to put it. But he always kind of does that and he puts the ball down and he takes four steps and he looks at the ref and once the ref blows he goes and takes it, that kind of thing. He does all that. He's actually scored one since then into the bottom left, I think. But obviously, no, no. the famously, it's basically a year and two similar penalties against the same opposition and all that kind of stuff. But um, ultimately, you're right, it didn't matter. I presume last year, remember, there was a whole thing, oh, what about Juranovic and stuff? And yeah. Whether you think he was just protecting them or not, I took him at face value that 
Yakimakis is a penalty taker. It's just that when Juranovic was taking penalties, Yakimakis was not on the pitch. Yeah. So whether you could say now, right, it's got to be Juranovic if they're both on, I don't know. Well, we'll see if they get another it's penalty. Right, in a couple of months' um, time when they get another penalty. A, a VAR assisted penalty. I don't know your thoughts on that, Sean. Um, I think by the letter of the law, as a penalty, I, I mean, it's one of those ones I, you kind of feel for the player in this situation, but his hand ultimately was was mm-hmm. out from his body, so I, I think it was a penalty. So that um, was a penalty. Why wasn't there a penalty at Hearts then? Oh, I know. If, you know, you know <laughs> I, I think the Hearts one was worse. I think that was actively, that was not a knee thing. That was like proper, that was yeah, yeah, the yeah. ball, no doubt about it. But anyway, um, Retro Celtic, would you think of that, Tony? What's your, what's your view from that, having been at the game? He says what? it's controversial, but Willie Collum had a decent game. Is that something you, you agree with? Or? I think Willie Collum uh, ref the game and was not the star. So, but which supposes them to, to, to bear. Yes. Kind of, right, the, 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 the dot dot dot. You know he likes to be the star, Willie Collum. But I think he, I think he did fair enough yesterday. I think he did well enough. You know, uh, you you can argue the toss on certain things, but. He was asked to go and check the penalty instant. He reviewed it when mm-hmm. he gave it. So I think uh, I think everybody's big question was why was about last week was why wasn't he the referee asked to review it himself then? You know, mm-hmm. so just put it down the middle. He says Pete Weedy, <laughs> indeed. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought Willie well, Collum was okay yesterday. I didn't really have any qualms, but I don't think the the players gave him anything to be well. Aaron Moy gave him a wee. Uh... Oh, I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. Way past I saw that. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah. No yeah. wonder everybody thought he played well. Um, that was a funny moment indeed. Yeah. Uh, no, the, to be fair, right, we've seen, I mean, there's, you'll know what instant I'm talking about, there's famous instances of refs not being able to take accidents at mm-hmm. face value on pitches. Yeah. So, for all we're saying, it's a laugh and all that. Fair play to Willie Collin for actually realising it was a it was an accident and all that and not, yeah. not, not as you say, not wanting to become the star through yeah. embarrassment or that kind of thing. You know what instant I'm referring to back in the yeah. back in the eighties with Johnny Doyle. Yeah. yeah. Also so, as fair well, enough to him for that, I suppose, but and also as well, he gave Haksabanovich the benefit of the doubt when he went in heavy in the goalkeeper with a mm. ball that he, he felt was there to be won. And mm. I think he accidentally kicked Jack Hamilton in the head. But Willie Collins out like, okay. And I thought that was a, a, a sensible bit of refereeing uh, when you know, because referees might have booked him because of the way Hamilton, mm-hmm. you know, it was a head knock and stuff, and it looked it looked dangerous. You could construe it as dangerous play, but he's only going to try and win a ball he thinks is there to be won. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, enough. I mean, contrast that though. I think later on, I don't really, I don't think Greg Taylor merited his booking. Um, but <laughs> overall, I think Retro's probably fair yeah. enough. Yeah, the chosen one getting booked, <laughs> not having it. <laughs> Yeah, and also he, he booked Cameron Carter Vickers early for you know a bit of six and one half a dozen of the other because the two of them were at it like that the whole game. So mm-hmm. you have to let that develop, and unless it turns to fisticuffs and there's actual mm-hmm. you know uh, violence, physical violence on it, but then that's just two guys, no quarter asked, no quarter given. You know, just a, a battle of strength and will there, isn't it? So you have to let that play out, as I say, unless it gets. Gets violent, then so be it. Pete McG says it's hard to get the words out, but he does think that Willie Collin was okay yesterday. Uh, Sean Malloy saying I'm he's surprised I remember the Johnny Doyle thing. I wasn't actually alive when it happened, I just know of the incident. But yeah. and the Johnny <laughs> Doyle one's just one of the most bizarre incidents in football refereeing ever. Right. And uh, I think the Steen, I think Steen actually goes to put him back in the park, doesn't he? <laughs> and just Back utter on. defiance at the, at the, yeah, at the, at the defiance, yeah. At the cheek yeah, to have actually done that out of embarrassment. Yeah. But um Somerset I, Park, no, yeah. I don't I, I must admit to Sean Molly, no, I wasn't wasn't there or anything, wasn't he? Wasn't he there? But um I do know it. I do know it. Johnny yeah. Doyle bus and all that from Greenock, so I kinda yeah. have to know what he's what he was up to. So Yes, if you know your history and all that. <laughs> Um, and who else stuck it to you, Tony? You, I mean, you've mentioned Darren Moy, obviously, but I've seen a lot of love in the comments for uh, Big Maritz Jens again. Um, yeah. think they had good games or not really tested in a way? Or? Well, I thought the two of them took it in turns to police Nibley and Jens was okay. I, I, I do like Big Jens, I, I think he's he, he brings a assuredness and a calmness, but every now and again, he'll still take that wee risk, wouldn't he, with a pass. Uh, Across the back four, and 
and he'll, you know, he gets away with it sometimes up here. But you know, I just wish that, and I've said it a couple of times in reference to him, player ratings. I just hope he irons that completely out of his game. Because mm. apart from that, I think he's really, really solid. I think Cameron Carter Vickers really likes playing alongside them. And I just think there's a, you know, I think there's height presence there. And, you know, I, I think it's kind of, you feel safe with those mm-hmm. two at the back of the pack. I've got to be honest. Right, that brings me to my next question then. If uh, Maurice Jens is doing so well, why are Celtic in the market for a left centre-back from Japan, Tony? Well, Apparently, yes, indeed, Yuki Kobayashi from Vissel Kobe. But you know why they're in the market for a left centre, left side centre-back? Because it's his natural position, Sean. Mm-hmm. I keep saying players have a natural position for a reason. We spoke to John Hughes earlier, who told us about left-sided centre-backs. If you're a centre-back, you're asked to play left side. It's it's maybe unnatural. So I think he just wants a natural left-sided centre-back, which is why he's gone back to raid the Japanese market for Yuki Kobayashi, a 22-year-old. Uh, that would be the fifth yep. from the J-League and by all accounts, that he's going to have a medical and sign in January. He's if a that, back. You can also play left back, yeah. Yep. Yeah, if you're a if you're a certain Celtic loan, named Liam Scales, are you seeing writing on the wall at this point, Tony? Are you thinking I'm, I'm sure. not going to beat Celtic? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> and Jim Goodwin might get his wish to have him mm-hmm. permanently. I know Liam Scales is progressing well at Aberdeen, but he he, he might come back and Ange might want to look at him, but. This is a guy who, in a market that Ange knows really, really well, and he's mm. raided it four times so far, and I think you have to say he's been, it's been very successful. So, again, you're going with the manager on this one, and you're trusting the reports that he's getting back about this boy. And I mm. think, uh, as Dan Orlovitz says, I think players are now seeing Celtic as a viable option to further their careers and maybe play, represent Japan at full international level. Well, I think so, I. And they have a manager in Ange that they know or they know the way his teams play. So it, it all kind of, it makes it makes sense for them, doesn't it? Aye, I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, almost, it's a destination. Yeah. It's a destination yeah. for them. I, I mean, yeah. I think it probably would have been anyway because of the, obviously, Nakamura stuff, the profile, Celtic's a worldwide club anyway. But if this, the Ange situation, Kyogo, Hatate, in particular, the two of them, eh, Maida as well, as a destination and a viable one that they can physically yeah. see, they can see what it's doing for people's careers yeah. when they're over here. So yeah, I think it's I think it's fair enough. So and I think that's a fair point that Dan makes, and I think the players can see that as well. Mm-hmm. As you say, they can see the the level that Celtic are playing at, at club level, mm-hmm. going into the Champions League, playing against Real Madrid. Okay, we've spoken about the Champions League group and how it never worked mm-hmm. out, but they want to go back there again. And I think if you're a player just now. And Anne shows interest and wants to bring you, then you come because you want to try and better yourself and ultimately play at that level, don't you? So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, Kobayashi, you had a look at your stats yet, Sean? I think you have, haven't you? You've had a wee bit I just the kind of the bare, the, bare, the, kind of, the bare minimum ones I have got. Uh, Stuart Ross is on the case. He's getting stuck into a, a deep dive scouting report on him, so that will probably be up tomorrow morning. Um, for you, so we'll mention it again tomorrow and stuff. But that'll that that'll be interesting reading because Stuart, you know, Tony, remember my claim to fame last year was hypothesizing that a certain left back called Rail Hatati could be a Ryan Christie replacement, and then they actually signed him. Mm-hmm. Well, Stuart's Stuart's got a claim to Kobayashi, um, because he back in May, I think, he wrote a piece, not even for us. I'm just giving him the, the, the credit, but not even for us, but he wrote a piece and said he might actually suit Celtic. This yep. guy uh, Kobayashi. So <laughs> He might have a claim to fame coming in in January if that's uh, if that comes to pass. Well, but to answer, on you go, sorry, on you go, no, you go. He's a six foot one ball playing defender, Sean. Well, aye, yeah, aye, left footed, which is obviously what you say is there about left centre back. Yeah. He played occasionally played at left back, but he's a, aye, a centre back. Um, why scouts got him as six foot one? Sometimes they can be a wee bit off, but good, that's fair enough. I mean, six foot one's a, a good height. Twenty two years old. Uh, Nearly 9,000 minutes of top-level football. Um, so I've kind of filtered it by the J1 League, the J League Cup and the AFC Champions League. Uh, but when you widen it out to youth football and second-tier games, it's just over 11,000, that kind of thing. <coughs> what I noticed just given a, a kind of cursory look was he must be durable because he rarely doesn't play a full match. There's very there's very rare occasions where it's not 95, 96 minutes or something all the way through. He doesn't intend to get taken on as a sub, doesn't intend to get taken off. Um you're saying ball playing, 
90 percent plus pass accuracy, which is good. Don't get me wrong. That you'd expect that if we come to Celtic, you'd expect that to increase. You'd expect him to get more accurate, even though he might actually be playing more risky passes at Celtic. Um, he receives 46 a game, just for comparison's sake. Carter Vickers receives 50 this season, so it's not actually that much of a difference. It's not a, it's not a massive chasm between that. Obviously, Vissel Kobe aren't playing well this season, whereas he's going to be coming to Celtic where how much they're going about the responsibility a Celtic centre-back mm-hmm. has. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing, no matter what, as much as I'm saying he passes it well and he, he receives the ball a lot, it's still going to be an adapting kind of gap, if you know what I mean. There's still going to be yeah. an, an adaptation there. Um, tries around seven passes into the final third per game, which kind of gives you a, an idea of how many times he's trying to get that ball through the lines and forward. For comparison, Carter Vickers tries eight. Um, apart from that, five, five interceptions a game, 60% aerial duels won, 62% duels won, that kind of thing. So it's just a, it's just a curse of the glance. Stuart will go right into that. Stuart will yeah, go yeah. Right look at the th- the way that he positions himself, the way that he tries to take the ball out, all that kind of stuff, to wait uh, to see how he might actually suit Celtic. So I would keep an eye out for that. He's represented Japan at all youth levels, hasn't he? Shown the retro Celtic, yep. they're saying no international appearances, but I think not for the senior team now. But that's yeah. not unheard of at that age, to be uh, honest, Tony. Yeah, like, for yeah, yeah. No. So, but he has one for the future, I believe, and they've got high hopes for him. And I think coming to Celtic would enhance that and maybe accelerate that. Japanese international process and gaining of honours. But yeah, I mean, it's that's the kind of news you want to wake up to, Sean, on a Monday. And again, looks like if you reference that Andy's want to get some business done early. He did it last year. Yep, aye. Had, that, had it done before January. <laughs> had yeah. the January transfers in before January. Uh, Sean Malloy made a, a fair point, to be honest, um, that most players in centre back won't be changed anyway, but that's, that's a fair, fair enough shout. Um, there's a couple of comments, Tony, about Stephen Welsh as well. So obviously, I brought up Liam Scales because of the left footed centre back that can play sure. left back type of thing. But I, Stephen Welsh as well. What does it say? What does it say about his future? Well, I guess the manager's the one you have to uh, answer that. But he's clearly bringing in somebody who feels comfortable at left side of centre back because he maybe thinks that. Like we've spoken about, they're still losing too many goals. Mm. And he wants a round peg and a round hole, as they say. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and this this is, well, that's the that's the only reason that I can see you. Can be, mm. We spoke about it, the, the left-sided centre-back, haven't we? Yeah. We've spoken about mm-hmm. it. For, and the guys that are playing there, they're doing well, but it's always going to be Cameron Carter-Vickers and somebody. Yep, mm-hmm. I, Carter Vickers and a another. Yeah, um, right yeah. now, I do think Marit Shenz has done enough that got the jersey. Was yeah. it you say again the yellow jersey, the, the Tour de France mm-hmm. thing? The, yeah, all that. And I agree with that. I think that's that's true. What I would say is, I mean, I wrote a piece last year in the the AZ game, AZ Altmar, when Stephen Welsh was was moved to left centre back, and I've just kind of pointed out that it, it was not easy. Especially if you're used to playing as Welsh was at the time, not only right centre back but right back. He wasn't ever really a left centre back. And it's almost, it's not just moving across a wee bit. Everything's a, a split second longer when you've got to figure out your body position in a different area of the park. You're not opening up to, to pass it out, all that kind of stuff. So I think Maurice Jens, given he's right-footed as well, slightly more two-footed than, than Welsh, I would say, I think he's adapted well to it. And the one thing I kind of was critical of him at first was for all his talk about modelling his game on Leonardo, Leonardo Bonucci and stuff, Um took quite a long time sometimes to make his mind up what he was going to do with it. But in the last few particular, you've saw those passes that he's getting out, he's getting out his feet and he's getting it over to Haxabana, yeah. in particular. Um, I think he's he's learning from that as well. So, so far, even though he's on the technically the wrong side, right-footed playing left centre, but I think, he's doing, I think he is doing well with it. I'd be intrigued to see if it does speed up the play, having an actual lefty there, because it, it, theoretically yeah. it should. You get, you get right-footed centre-backs that like to play in the left, Van Dyke, obviously, which I always think is an unfair guy to say because who's better than Van Dyke, really? But, um, but you do you get players that are right footed that prefer to play on the left, but it's not a, it's not a given that you're going to adapt put it that way. So I think Jens has done well in that regard. I think could be part of Andy's thinking that an actual left side centre mm-hmm. back will speed up the play. I think so, aye. and will stop you from losing so many goals. I, I just maybe I hopefully. second guess him, which we do a lot. I think we'll run a clean sheet, so come. I do think it will come again. Um, yeah. And I realise the first comment, and I'll probably be, Ange doesn't care about clean sheets. And I'm all right. I care, I care if you get clean sheets as well, though. That's the thing. Um, and I think it will come round to that. 
Um, again, I mean, we've just got one there, so hopefully that's the start of a few. be good to get one on Wednesday, Tony. Oh, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start there. You asked about impressing so maybe, uh, I thought Jota was, I thought his attitude was outstanding when he came aye, on aye. yesterday, and it was as if he'd never been away, but it just showed you it was only five and a half games, but by goodness, they missed him, didn't they? Aye, aye. I mean, Ange got asked a question when you were in it after it, like it was a testament to the team that they've not really missed Jota or Carl, Carl, Carl McGregor. I think they have missed them, right? But I do think that the question was really just meaning you yeah. are still winning, you are still, apart from the Champions League, which he's actually played well in, but never won, all that kind of stuff. So I took the question for what it meant, but I do still think that they have missed them. You were only, it's only natural. Yeah, and indeed. Decent point by Sean. My lawyer says you might, Ange might have just mm-hmm. spotted an opportunity to seal a nugget I'm talking about Kobayashi uh, before. You know, We've managed to get half an hour in, by the way, Tony. Talking about somebody called Kobayashi without making a usual suspects reference. <laughs> which I think is worthy of praise. That's not bad, but yeah, and can't really complain about his record so far. I mean, that, that's that's exactly yeah, what we're thinking, Sean, that, yeah, he he likes to do his business early, he likes to identify players and he likes to go and get them. So right. by all intents and purposes, the news emanating from Japan is that it, a guy has to see, do his medical and that's the deal sealed because they've agreed a fee with Visa Kobe, so... Yeah, and, I mean, watch, watch this space as always with yeah. it. There's, there's time and all, all that kind of stuff. But if that does come to pass, whether it's him or whether they, they just get their business done well elsewhere, but you've got to hand it to, to the club again, I would say, at that point. If that's yeah. um, January Everybody. last year, uh, the summer in particular, Carter Vickers and Jota, yeah. and then the rest of, adding the rest of the month of that was, was a sublime window, frankly. Um, so if they're going to approach this January and not stand part, and get their business done and add where they need to add that again. I'm I'm loving what I'm seeing from the club. And and to, yeah, and you've got to applaud everybody involved in that process. Michael yep. Nicholson, the manager, and mm-hmm. those who seal those kind of deals. I'm laughing at Brian Robertson, who, in reference to your clean sheets, who said, what did Brian Roberts say? It's Madrid, Sean, not Lourdes. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for a miracle in Madrid and keep a clean sheet. But I, I actually would love to see Celtic sign off by getting something in Madrid, I think the kind of way they've played in the group would deserve something mm. to to cheer on. But uh, we'll speak about that tomorrow and Wednesday, of course. But no, I think a uh, very positive performance. Only re- retro Celtic coming in saying, who's Kaiser Soze then, Sean? It's got to be Greg Taylor, isn't it? <laughs> most, people, most people thought he wasn't up for. He couldn't possibly be, be as good as what he could be. Turns out he's a mastermind behind the whole thing. <laughs> what be Greg Taylor? Two goals in two games and uh, a nice way to uh, celebrate your 100th game for the club. Yep. Yep, yep. And a man who said he doesn't shoot enough, he's shooting daft now, isn't he? <laughs> he? He's getting into range and he's just having a pot. And that. Do you know what? No, often you see a goalkeeper nutmeg from 25 yards, Tony. I, I know, and he came through a ruck of players, that's why uh, he was unsighted. I actually felt for the keeper because it wasn't like a... Like, it was travelling at some speed, though, to be fair. Uh-huh. Uh, so, and good on Greg Taylor for because it's the goal that wins the game. Hmm. Uh, and some mad random person says, agree, Tony Celtic de- deserve more points than <laughs> what we have. <laughs> I didn't realise that that's actually what it was called there. I thought you were just you were just saying it was some <laughs> mad random. Well, that's the moniker. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> but, uh, I do like that uh, moniker on that handle. That's very good. But yeah, I mean, I, I just think, I think when you come away from a game enthused, and you're still missing your inspirational captain, mm-hmm. and then you're seeing, you're waking up, or, you know, you're coming home, and and later on at night, there's news breaking that there's more potential signings coming, and uh, they show no signs of letting up. That was the thrust of my piece yesterday. It's on the website today about mm-hmm. champions never stopping and just dealing with everything that's thrown in front of them, but still doing it with a bit of panache, a bit of flair, and a bit of style. There's the link to it there. Yeah. Uh, and also, any kind of thought about a, a hoodoo in Livingston has been finally buried, hasn't it? Because the last two games, they played, they played them off the park and, and played like champions. And, you know, I, I just you just see that there's kind of no let up mm-hmm. in the intensity and the way they're playing and the way they're going about their business. Certainly domestically, on in the European scene, it's different, but they're still learning how to cope and adapt with that. So, Yep, and uh, and if you can add more players, which the manager clearly, I did say a while ago that 
the manager's always thinking ahead, isn't he? Mm. Always thinking ahead. And yep. he's been looking clearly and I mean we were talking about the concession of goals, it was a bugbear of yours. So what do you do? You go and get a position where you go and strengthen the position where you think they need left sided centre back. Let's see what happens when you get a natural left sided centre back coming onto your team. There has to be a difference. So mm-hmm. and he's gone out and identified a guy early and bring him in. And I and I don't imagine he'll be the last to come in, Sean. No, I, I think it'll be a couple. I think there'll be a couple in January. More importantly, um, no exits, I'm hoping, except maybe maybe a couple of people that maybe aren't going to play much, but uh, certainly no major exits, I, I, I would like to think. Um, I think if you're a Celtic There will be interest, I'm sure, but no, I, I think right. no exits, no exits. We were all cup dependent as well, depending on the interest, won't it? So, mm. But I think if you're the manager and you're the, that squad of players, you, you'll want to stay, won't you? I would think you would want to stay and, and see where it goes again next season. You want to get back to the stage that you're, you're playing in and you're going to exit the stage on centre stage on mm-hmm. Wednesday night. Just get a feel for that. See how you cope. See what you do. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm all for that. I, I, I just hope that they can keep everybody together and I'm sure they will. Mm. Hope so. On that note, uh, about Wednesday night, I want to end on Jota's comment. Uh, he's asked him in the, the presser, is that is, is the Bernabeu the kind of stage that he, that he wants to be on and all that kind of thing? And he basically just says, all the world's a stage to him. He loves every stage that he gets to play on and he's got to be at it every game. And I like that answer. I like that answer because I think oh, he right. actually he lives that as well. Oh, oh. I, I've, literally every ground in the world is his stage. <laughs> I'll fess up and say that was my question. Was it? Was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was surprised by the answer, but I like the answer too. Hmm. That, uh, yeah, and he he kind of smiled, you know, his jota smile, mm-hmm. uh, as as you do. And I was quite taken with that answer myself. I thought, well, good on you, you know. And he he is. I think he's busting to play in the Bernabeu. Mm-hmm. I think he's deep down delighted that he's been called up to the provisional Portugal squad, mm-hmm. and he's realised that playing for Celtic isn't such a bad thing because two That's years ago he said he he was nowhere near it, mm-hmm. and he's come to Scotland, fell in love with this club played out his skin and is now on the fringes of international honours, which I think would mean the world to him. Uh, mm. And hopefully he does play in the Bernabeu and turns it on and, well, uh, and he gets the international recognition. But again, that would end up with suitors, wouldn't it? But hey. Well, I, I think, whether I know it's a 55-man provisional list and all that, but I still think it's a feather in his cap because what it tells... What it tells him is, and what it tells any other kind of golden youngster that has maybe fell by the wayside a wee bit and maybe needs to, to come somewhere to get back in the in the main picture and stuff, is that if you go to Celtic, you will be watched. People will notice if you're at Celtic. You're not going to be, just because you're in Scotland, you're not going to be ignored. He's been watched, and all right, he probably won't realistically make that World Cup squad for, for Portugal. But to get that recognition that he's on the radar while yeah. playing this brilliant football for Celtic... Is a fair than his cap, but also in Celtic's cap, I think. I think anybody now realises that, as you say, Celtic are a club where that can resurrect careers or can enhance your career. But Remember, like, this, it wasn't meant to be like this for Jota. He was meant to, he was like the golden guy. He was meant to come through, like so many of them have at Benfica, really highly, highly rated, such a stellar youth career. And then it just all stalled. It just didn't quite make that gap. In 22, I mean, is slightly on the older side for a fledgling kind of uh, fledgling youth career, valid yep. lead and stuff, and then he came to Celtic and everything's just everything has just clicked for him, and that's I mean it's not a culmination. You would say a culmination would be actually getting into the squad, and he's probably wanting that at some stage. But as I say, I, I certainly view it as a feather in his cap and in Celtic's. The retro Celtic comes in and says Jota almost had a granny of that, and uh, Sam Hartley said lovely photo of Jota and the fans. That that was a a cracking mm-hmm. moment yesterday and the the woman's face said it all didn't it she was mm-hmm. just i'm not usually boring. one for um see see like a gig or a, or a game or anything i'm not usually one for standing with your phone out and stuff yeah but there must there must be a cracking picture from the the guy that was running down the front of his phone and stuff yeah there must be. of course uh and yeah i'm not one for that either but he he will have a a prize picture there uh mm-hmm. hopefully he puts it out on social media and lets everybody see it but just that you, Jota running over and celebrations with the women and the fans that were there was 
it was nice to watch. And I, and I think he enjoyed that moment as well. I think he missed it. He was, you know, when he was asked about kind of being out for five and a half games, he was just kind of like, well, you have to prepare yourself for these things. But it's as if he'd been out forever, is not it? You know? And, Sean you Malloy, know. I thought he was going to win, <laughs> This is a morning show, Sean. Come on, family. Yeah, family. Come on. Far, far too early for that. Well before the water, Sean. But yeah. But no, I think uh, it just kind of typified the day that Celtic had yesterday. Yep. And uh, kind of good news is spilled over into today with the potential sign of Yuki Kobayashi, medical possibly, yep. and then in early January uh, incoming. So, yep, I think uh, at all, all in all, Sean, a, a wonderful weekend's work mm-hmm. by Celtic. Yep. And I think that's... And then... When you go, sorry. No, no, I just go say, yep, and we've got the, the small matter of Real Madrid in the burn about it. We'll yes, talk about it over the next couple of days. So, <laughs> yes, that'll, that'll keep us busy. Might watch it through cracked fingers or not. But Real Madrid haven't exactly been on the ball for the past couple of games. You live in hope, Sean, don't you? You take <laughs> you take crumbs of comfort from these things. <laughs> like you beat them when they drew yesterday, didn't they? Yep. So, to an unfashionable Spanish side. So there you go. Can we make it three in a row and give them, well, let's see them not Don't win. get me excited, Tony. Don't, Don't get me too excited. <laughs> Indeed. And we'll have to mention again, Leslie will be there, won't she? Yep. Yep, yep. Um, so, trip of a lifetime. She was still giggling. I had to phone her to get extra details. And, and uh, Friday, and she was still still on the ceiling. So, bye. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoy it, Leslie. Uh, Cut the of the Celtic way and travel back home. Just have a great time. I hope Celtic bring back a result and give you the memory of a lifetime. But I'm sure it will be. Is still laughing? <laughs> still laughing. There you go. <laughs> nice one, Leslie. But direct your attention to the start line along the bottom, which I was derelict in my duty and never did at the start. But we're more than a podcast. You know that. We've got lots of interesting articles on the website for you to read. There was a Steve Evans, Steve Evans big interview on the site at the weekend. If you haven't had a chance to check that out, he speaks about his love for Celtic despite having played his career up in Scotland but managed all his career down south. It's, that's good, interesting chat. He talks about his love for Celtic. But, yeah, subscribe to the Celtic Way. You know what I'm going to say. It's a pound for two months of full access to everything that we do. And all you have to do is hit a button, www.celticway.co.uk forward slash subscribe. A bargain. A pound for two months of full access. Can't say fairer than that. All right, Sean? Not at all, Tony, yep. <laughs> the retro Celtic. Send us a postcard, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, we'll continue to build up to the Real Madrid game over the course of the next couple of days. Hope you've enjoyed this morning. It's been, uh, can I say, Sean, happy Monday. Yeah. Can't beat that. Can't beat that happy better than that, yep. <laughs> Indeed. We'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same back channel. You know the drill. But yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the comments. We do like the the banter and the toing and throwing and we, we enjoy getting involved and we enjoy the fact that you guys get involved. Sean, first class contribution as always. Take care. Have a wonderful Monday. Cheers, Tony. Cheers, guys. <laughs>